One constant source of contention within my household is cleaning. Go figure, right? Two parents plus four kids plus two cats equals a lot of opportunity for the house to look very lived in. Add in the normal busyness of a family of six with two working parents, kids involved in activities, anxiety from two parents when the house isn't spotless, the not caring of the kids when things are on the floor, and the cat's complete unwillingness to help contribute to the household that they live in, you get a recipe for frustration. You know, 90% of the time, all it takes is a dedicated 30 minutes or so of everyone pitching in to clean, maybe an extra hour if you add in seasonal cleaning. But you'd think that we'd asked everyone to run a marathon without training with the amount of pushback that's given to us. Oh, it's too hard. I don't want to. Why isn't so-and-so cleaning more? Oh, I have to go do this and this. I can't clean and so on and so on. Sound familiar to anyone? Most of the time, we get done with cleaning and the response was, well, I guess that wasn't so bad. But you know, we've all been trained that in order to get results, we have to put in a great deal of work. Hello, I'm Pastor Stephanie Christoffels, Pastor for Worship and Engagement at Bethlehem Lutheran Church in St. Cloud, Minnesota. And I want to personally welcome you to this online worship opportunity. At Bethlehem, we strive to follow the example of Jesus in welcoming everyone for who they are, just as they are. No matter how you are feeling, weary, stressed, joyful, rested, or something in between, we trust that God will meet you in this time of worship. As we prepare for our time of worship, we are gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've all been trained that in order to get results, we have to put in a great deal of work. The things that promise a high reward for a small amount of work are usually full of garbage. You know, things like, you can lose weight by not changing anything about your lifestyle. Just take this pill twice a day, or sprinkle this magic concoction on your food, and you'll lose tons of weight. You can make thousands of dollars by playing games on your phone every single day. You could work from home for two hours a week and become a boss babe and own your own company. We get sucked into these get rich quick or get thin quick schemes. And then after wasting time and money, realize it was a scam. Because it actually takes work to accomplish your goals. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read this letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. 
So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not be washed in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself in seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. All right, so let's meet Naaman. Naaman is this guy who's used to hard work. He is a commander, the commander in the king of Aram's army. He's a seasoned warrior, and he also suffered from a skin disease. Now, skin diseases, whatever they may be, they're not fun. In fact, they're quite uncomfortable to deal with. And Naaman wants his disease cured. Because again, it's not fun having some sort of skin disease. And really, that's what leprosy meant is any sort of skin disease. And Naaman, he's prepared to do whatever it takes to cure himself of this disease. He's prepared to pay for his healing with money, lots of money, and rich garments. However, the instructions that he has given shock him. Go wash in the Jordan River, which is not very majestic to be honest, seven times and you'll be made clean. Now Naaman is not happy. First of all, why didn't Elisha, this man of God, come out and talk to him himself? Why did he send a messenger? And why the Jordan River? Why not the rivers of Damascus? Why not just wave your hands over me and make me clean? Where's the dog and pony show that should be surrounding this? And then his servant said, but you know, if the prophet had just told you to do something more difficult, wouldn't you have done it? How much more do you need when all he said is, go wash and be clean? So he sucks it up, he goes and he does it. He washes in the Jordan and he's made clean. Pretty miraculous, right? So a couple weeks ago, I finished reading two separate memoirs written by women who broke away from a conservative Christian group. One, the woman they wanted, shattering the illusion of the good Christian wife, was written by Shannon Harris, the ex-wife of Joshua Harris, author of the book I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And the second was Counting the Cost by Jill Duggar Dillard, second daughter of the reality TV family famous for having 19 children. Each of these books talked about the rules of their churches. For Shannon, as a pastor's wife, she was expected to give up her dreams, to have perfect children, be an unpaid member of the church staff. She needed to look perfect, never question, never express any dissatisfaction, not have any friends outside of the church. And for Jill, she was also expected to submit to the authority of her husband, and more importantly, her father. Going outside what they called the umbrella of authority, meaning her mother and then her husband and her father would lead her to damnation. The list of rules she was expected to follow obediently without question in order to maintain her salvation were fast. And both of these women wrote about how they slowly broke away from these beliefs and are still disentangling from them. These memoirs reminded me of many conversations that I've had over the years with friends and acquaintances about salvation and grace. 
grace is a foreign concept to many who have been taught for years that their salvation depends on what they do, that they can lose God's grace because it's conditional. And for them, the idea that salvation isn't some big production or something that can be snatched away from them is hard to grasp. My question to all of you, do you really truly believe in God's grace? Do you believe that God loves you so much that God sent Jesus to die for you, for all of us, and that all we need to do to receive eternal life is believe that? And if you do believe it, what do you do with it? Do you try to make it harder than it really is by adding a bunch of rules and regulations as to what constitutes proper salvation? Do we say, no God, that really can't be what you meant because that's not like what I imagined, kind of like Naaman did with his healing. You know, where, where do you fall? I saw this meme on Facebook the other day and you know, it hit me differently than something like this normally would. It said, if God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn it, I doubt he sent you. So not only was I like, yeah, that's right, but I also took pause and went, ugh, how often am I guilty of that? How often am I guilty of looking at someone and judging them based on what they look like or what they believe? How often do I make things harder than they need to be because of my own weird need to make things more complicated? And then I went even deeper. How often do I have a hard time figuring out how to slow down or relax on a rare day off? How often do I think that I need to do a bunch of busy work or multitask on something, like making sure that I'm listening to the news and picking up my counter with one hand while I'm brushing my teeth, because you know, otherwise it's wasted time. How often do I just sit and rest in order, or instead of trying to prove to this unnamed multitude that I'm gainfully employed all the time, or prove it to myself that I'm gainfully employed, that I'm doing something. How often do I think that I'm unworthy of God's love as if I could dictate whether or not God loves me based on how much stuff I do or how much stuff I don't do. The story of Naaman goes way beyond just a simple wash and be clean. It challenges our idea that we have to constantly be doing something in order to prove our worth, in order to achieve salvation. Our salvation, unlike cleaning our houses, doesn't require an elaborate checklist. Our salvation is not something that comes from us, but instead it comes from God. You know, we tend to be like Naaman, and we make things way harder than they need to be. The good news of God is that God doesn't. The good news of God is that it's something as simple as wash and be clean. God doesn't need us to prove that we can follow rules, that we can check everything off the to-do list, Instead, God just tells us wash and be clean. Believe. Thanks be to God for that great news. Amen.
I want to thank you for making time in your schedule to engage with Bethlehem today. If you found this video meaningful and believe that your friends could find value in it as well, please share it with them. Giving this video a thumbs up and leaving a comment also helps this message reach more. Bethlehem's ministry is sustained through your generous support. Thank you for making what we do together possible. Making time for intentional prayer is an important part of our faith practice. If you have a prayer that you wish to share with our community, please leave a public comment, send us a private message, or contact the church office. Each week, our staff and our congregation pray for those who have been named to us. And now please join me in prayer. Gracious God, renew our spirits and let grace abound in our lives. Help us to know and embrace your grace, and know that our salvation is a gift from you that we can do nothing to earn. Help us treat others with compassion and mercy, and empower us to stand up for ourselves and others. Be with those who are living in dark places, who struggle to have hope. Be with all who live with anxiety, depression, and thoughts of suicide. Walk with those who are experiencing grief and help their grief be witnessed and acknowledged. Hear the names of those that we name in the silence of our hearts and those we name out loud, including Rosemary Benson, Mary Jo Buning, Jeff Blair, Betty Eastman, Peter Ede, Bill Gavin, Elaine Gerke, Joel Luce, Andy and Sarah Merrick, Elizabeth Munt, Barb Cyrils, Mimi Swanson. Bring them healing even if they cannot be cured. We ask this all in Christ's name, amen. And now refreshed by our time of worship together and ready to re-engage with our community as the hands, feet, and heart of God take this blessing with you. May almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you and keep you in God's grace today and always, amen.